Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, distinguished moderator and speakers, distinguished viewers, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Dr. Mohammed Abdullah Al Ali, Director General of Trends Research and Advisory, I want to welcome you to Trends, a symposium entitled A Global Anti-COVID-19 Treatment Between Development Efforts and Regulatory Pro Protocol. Uh, the symposium will be moderated by Dr. Ziad Yaqub Najjar. He is Dr. Ziad, he is uh, MENA Regional Operational Director at uh, VSAMIT Health Care Solution and former WHO uh, Health Promotion Consultant. Uh, please, Dr. Uh, Ziad, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mr. Ahmed, thank you so much. And welcome to our distinguished speakers. Um, we will uh, start with uh, uh, Dr. Jill Horowitz. Is that the right pronunciation? Horowitz, yes. right, thank yes, you. Yes, it is, thank you. Uh, she's the Executive Director of Strategic Operations, Laboratory of Molecular Immunology at Rockefeller University from the United States. Welcome, uh, Dr. Jill, and she will be covering the uh, topic of monoclonal antibodies in treatment and prevention of COVID-19. Dr. Jill, the floor is yours. You will have a slight presentation, right? Yes. So I can the floor it. is yours. Thank you so much. I can share it now. Uh, just please let me know um, when, it, when you can see it. You can see it? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect, terrific, thank so you. You have, you have 20 minutes and mm -hmm. I will give you a hint when your time is over. Okay, thank great, thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, so I, I want to uh, tell you how exciting it is for me to represent Rockefeller University at this symposium and how excited we are, you know, as always, um, science is one of the one of the very few topics where international and global cooperation is really very real. And so we are extremely excited to be participating today. So thank you. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I uh, got my PhD from Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York and had a career um, in, at the, in the government before I moved into industry. I was a reviewer at the um, product reviewer at the US FDA. So I know something about how um, pharmaceuticals are brought to market uh, and then moved, moved over to the National Institutes of Health uh, where I worked on grants and contracts in the program office. And uh, when my family moved back to New York I started my almost 20 year career in industry where I worked for YF vaccines um, in uh, respiratory vaccines, then for Novartis in respiratory drugs. And then when Novartis went into the vaccines business worked again in vaccines, uh, then for Pfizer supporting oncology uh, and eventually moved to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, also in the area of vaccines. And at that point uh, was working on HIV prevention um, uh, modalities and was introduced to the group here at the Rockefeller. And the reason I'm telling you this is, uh, is not only that I moved over to the Rockefeller full time, but because the project that I worked on at the Rockefeller uh, became very relevant to COVID. And uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about the science and I think you'll see why I'm describing this to you. Uh, people who are infected with a virus uh, recover because their Im immune system recognizes the virus and makes, among other things, makes antibodies against the virus. And you may know that HIV is a very long-term chronic infection and you may not know that there are individuals who uh, can control their HIV without drugs. We call them uh, elite controllers and it takes their immune system several years to develop antibodies that can control the virus as it mutates. When, when this was understood, a number of investigators all over the world 
sought to isolate these special antibodies and to find out if they can be used as a treatment, potentially a cure, and also a prevention for HIV. And in fact, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is very interested in bringing this, treat, this modality to Africa where the HIV disease burden is greatest in the, in the world. And I am fortunate enough to work uh, for the Nussen, at the Nussenzweig Laboratory at the Rockefeller, which is one of the groups that has successfully isolated broadly neutralizing antibodies as a treatment and prevention for HIV. So that was my job, was bringing these products to market. When COVID happened a few months ago, and we and others realized that we could use this same method uh, potentially as a therapy and possibly a preventative for COVID. So I won't be talking about vaccines. My, my, my colleague, Andrew L. Nathan, will be talking about vaccines. Um, we, we hope that a vaccine is approved, um, but we believe that there will always be populations that will not be eligible for a vaccine and for prevention purposes, antibodies will be suitable for those individuals. In addition, um, I, think, I think maybe antibodies are among the only uh, type of product that will also be used as a treatment. So these monoclonal antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus are being developed as both a treatment and a prevention against, the, against COVID disease. Uh, so I think uh, with that, I'll talk a little bit about the virus and a little bit about the immune system, and then you'll understand why they are, we believe that they will be useful. Okay, so can everybody see my slide on the coronaviruses? Sorry? Can you, everyone can see my slide on the coronaviruses? I did, yes, of course. Oh, good. Okay, I just want to make sure that you're following along. Absolutely, absolutely. So first, a little bit about the viruses themselves. Um, you can see on the left, this is a micrograph from the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. of the virus. And you can see the reason they're called coronaviruses is the prominent spike protein, which is on the surface of the virus. You see it in blue in this micrograph. And then in the cartoon, it's in kind of a yellow orange kind of a color. It's the spike, it's called the spike protein. It's on the outside of the virus. You can also see in the cartoon, the, the membrane of the virus, which encircles the virus. It's made of lipid. And inside the membrane, there's a membrane glycoprotein. That's a protein with a sugar on it. There's also a nucleocapsid protein that's inside the virus itself. And then there's an envelope protein that also sits in the membrane. Inside the virus is the nucleic acid of the virus that carries the virus's genetic material. And in this case, coronaviruses are RNA viruses. They're also DNA viruses, but coronaviruses, nu nucleic acid happens to be RNA. Um, and RNA viruses mutate at a very predictable rate. So you can see um, on the right side the evolution of these viruses, which were, which were first defined in the literature in 1965, but are you know, probably thousands of years old. You can see that the current virus that we're talking about, which is in lineage B, um, it's not SARS-CoV, it's SARS-CoV-2, which was not yet defined at the time that this review was written in the earlier part of 2019. You can see that SARS is related to MERS and related to a number of the other coronaviruses. These alpha coronaviruses here cause the human cold. Uh, there are also avian, that's bird coronaviruses. And so these are all closely related and they evolved from another subfamily which evolved from the family called coronaviridae that evolved from the Nidoviralis family and so on and so forth. So this is a little bit about the virus. And the, one, the other thing you can, I would like you to notice on the cartoon is this, this thing here, which is an antibody. So these are, this is a cartoon of how the antibody recognizes the spike protein on the surface of the coronavirus. 
And as I said, uh, people make antibodies in response to foreign uh, invaders like viruses and bacteria. And that's how we get better is by activating our immune system. So a little bit more about the spike protein because that's what all of the uh, all of the vaccines and all of the of all of the antibodies are directed against, and the reason for that is you can see on the right here. This is the three dimensional structure of the spike protein, and it's not just the spike protein; it's also its receptor. So this green uh, human ACE2 uh, three dimensional structure protein on the right, on the upper right here, that protein exists. It's part of our normal biology. It exists on many of our cells. It exists in our um, cells in our, on our respiratory tract. Um, interestingly, um, it also is on the outside of our endothelial cells. And those are the cells that line our, uh, our blood vessels. And this may be the reason why many people who have COVID have uh, symptoms that are reflected in their, um, both in their heart muscle, but also in their vessels. We, they get strokes, they get clots, and, and that may be because this spike protein that's shown here in gold, um, the, 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 the receptor binding domain of the spike is in gold, you know, recognizes this receptor binds very tightly in fact, it binds 10 times more tightly than SARS binds to its receptor. And I think that maybe my personal feeling is that maybe one of the reasons why people can get so sick from this, from this virus. So as I said, this is a three dimensional structure of the SARS-CoV spike protein. Um, you can see a lot of the protein here in purple. And what's, what's in gray behind it um, are two other spike proteins because the spike protein exists as a trimer um, on, the, uh, on the surface of, of cells. And it has to be trimerized in order to, in order to recognize its receptor. So this is kind of how it looks in three-dimensional space. This is a cartoon of how one monomer of the spike protein looks. This is the front end. This is the back end. And it's about on 1,300 amino acids long, it's not very long. Um, it, this is the receptor binding domain around the middle. And so it binds to the receptor. And then there's a hinge, what we call a hinge here, because the protein actually is bent over and, 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 and there, this is a hinge. It can exist in an up or a down um, um, structure. And when the, when it binds to the receptor, it actually gets cleaved at this hinge and this S1 attachment gets left behind, but the S2 part of the protein sort of, you know, allows the, the viral membrane to bind with the cell membrane and shoots the rest of the virus into cells. That's how the virus gets inside of cells. And then it is able to replicate, it uses the cellular machinery to replicate its own RNA uh, uh, and also to, um, to make, make proteins which assemble into more viral particles. And then when there are many, many viral particles, it breaks out of the cell and that furthers the infection. So that's how the virus works. And what happens when the virus comes into our immune system, there are many cells in our immune system, but I'm going to simplify that part of the discussion and talk about B cells and T cells. Those are the two of the most important active types of cells in our immune systems. So the cartoon, you can see in the cartoon, the B cell is saying that I attack invaders outside of cells, which is when the virus is circulating around your bloodstream. Um, and T cells, the T cell is saying, I attack infected cells. As I was saying, when the virus is inside of a cell, the T cell kills it. When the virus is outside circulating around in, the, in your serum, the B cell takes care of it. There are many other cells that participate, but you know these are the two principal components. And what I wanna show you here is this thing that sits on the outside of B cells. It also gets circulates freely in the serum, but 
this is um, an, uh, an antibody that's attached to the outside of the B cell. Um, and so you, now here's a close up picture of an antibody. Um, and we always draw them looking like a Y because they actually do look like the English letter Y. And they have, all antibodies have a constant region that's shown in blue here and a variable region. Now the constant region, you can imagine, you know, this molecule has a very important job. So then that job does not vary from infection to infection to infection. So the constant region, and uh, this is a dimer, the left side looks exactly the same as the right side and the dimerization is, is, is shown here. So the blue part of the heavy chains and the light chains is constant. It, it remains and it, it, it embodies all of the, what we call the effector functions of the antibody, which allow all kinds of good things from your immunological perspective to happen. Uh, it, among those things that the effector function does, it, it actually recruits the T cells and macrophages and natural killer cells to come and kill the invader. So these are on all antibodies, the constant region. What varies and what's kind of fascinating from an, an immunological perspective are the, the variable regions. What's called here the antigen binding fragment that are kind of at the edge at the outside here. And they vary. And the reason they vary is they have to bind, they have to recognize you know, millions of different antigens over the course of your life. So in this picture, in this cartoon here, this blue antigen, you can see that it, the shape of it fits the antigen binding fragment on the antibody. But you can also see down here in this little picture that there's lots of different antigens, you know, every different antigen, every different virus, every different bacterium um, is, has a different three-dimensional structure. And so it's recognized by an antigen binding fragment that is specific for that antigen. So you might ask yourself, you know, how does that happen? Um, and I'm gonna go into that a little bit because in order to understand the product, we need to understand that. Um, so uh, I'm gonna go back to the structure of a B cell, another cartoon of a B cell, um, and showing again, these, these antibodies are bound to the surface of the B cell. Well, how do they get to recognize all of the different uh, antigens that come in? So that happens in a place in your body called the germinal center, which are within your lymph organs, your lymph nodes, your spleen, where B cells proliferate, they differentiate, and they actually mutate their genes. And that's, I think, something that's a little bit hard to grasp because usually we learn and we're told our whole lives that all of your G, all of your DNA in every cell in your whole body is the same. And that's true, except for your immune cells. So how does that work? Uh, you, you make these, naive, what we call naive B cells, they're circulating throughout your body, they go into your lymph nodes, and then they expand, right? One, one cell gives rise to lots of other cells, but importantly, during that expansion, they undergo this what's called somatic hypermutation. Somatic means that it's not, not the kind of um, genetic change that occurs in your sex organs, but rather somatic means the whole rest of your body, anywhere that's not in your ovaries, you know, if you're a woman, is somatic. So, you know, these cells are shuffling their DNA into, you know, thousands of different configurations. So when they produce an antibody, when these cells produce antibodies on their surfaces, they either, they either have improved affinity for the virus or, or they have disadvantageous mutations. If those mutations are not advantageous to the B cell, then the cell undergoes apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. It's a specific kind of cell death you have five go, minutes. Sorry? Five minutes. Uh, so the, so if, the, if, the, um, if they recognize the virus better than they, if they have improved inf affinity, then they go on to mature and they make 
B cells in the plasma that make lots and lots of antibodies, or they make memory B cells, which recognizes the virus many years later, if need be. So I think that will tell you how we can now pull those cells out. So what we can do is we can, we can label these memory B cells and these plasma cells using a, uh, a fluorescent label that looks like the antigen. So we take the S protein, we label it fluorescently, and then we put it into a machine called a, fluorescent, a fluorescence activated cell sorter that shoots the cells through a tiny, tiny little hole. And either you, it, it, in control serum, you will find all the fluorescence in this big, this big label, this big uh, section down here. But if you shoot through cells that actually have antibody that recognizes the S protein, as all of these people do who have been infected and recovered from Corona, you can isolate tiny, tiny amounts of those plasma cells and those memory B cells that recognize the antigen very, very well. And that's what we and others have done. And that this enables you to pull, physically pull those cells out, clone them, and then reproduce thousands and thousands and millions of copies of the antibody that has effectively cured people. So we did a clinical trial. We asked those people to come in after they recovered. And this is the flyer that we sent out. This is the breakdown of all the people and their symptoms and their ages and their sex. And uh, this, is, uh, talk, this shows, about the, shows the antibodies that we were able to isolate. These are controls. They're not so good, but the red and blue here are very good antibodies. They bind very, very tightly. You can see they bind much better than the controls. Not only do they bind, but they actually kill the virus. They neutralize the virus. And you can see that in this figure here, those same two antibodies, you can dilute them one to 5,000 and one to 10,000 and still kill the virus. So they're very strong. What do we do next? We start we start, a, we start to bring them into the clinic. And uh, so what we do is we take the ones with strong neutralizing activity, we put them into animal models like a mouse model where they work very well and a monkey model where those studies are still in progress. And at the same time, we make sure that they are very pure and very safe. Um, and then we file an investigational new drug application with the FDA, which uh, will be filed in our case over the next couple of months. And if the FDA thinks that it's safe to proceed, then we can start our first in human studies. Um, so that's my project in a nutshell. I want to thank um, all of my many, many, many colleagues. Um, I'm, I work in Michelle Nussenzweig's group at the Rockefeller. These are all of our uh, collaborators. And I want to, of course, thank the people who came in to donate their their plasma so that we could isolate these antibodies. And uh, also want to thank Bristol Myers Squibb who stepped up and called us up one day and told us they would manufacture these antibodies uh, for free um, with no strings attached and really uh, allowed us to move the project forward. So. Thank you, Dr. Jill. Uh, you, you was just on time. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. That was really enlightening. Uh, a lot of useful information and updated one. Uh, as we said, uh, the symposium is, is composed of you of two sessions. The first one will cover the issue of uh, update on uh, vaccine and the drug uh, COVID-19 vaccine and drug treatment. Uh, the second session will deal with uh, uh, protocols and processes involved in the development of these vaccines. And uh, so, uh, the, our second speaker uh, will be Mr. Uh, David. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, Mr. David Zigdon, CEO, MIGVAX, Miguel Galilea Research Institute, Israel. Welcome uh, to this uh, uh, symposium. And uh, you will be covering the issue of uh, uh, COVID-19 oral subunit vaccine. So the floor is yours, please 20 minutes and I will tell you when your time is up. 
Thank you. Oh, uh, <coughs> thank you very much. Masai al Khair, Ashukum al Ahadi, Al Munasab al Fadila, Kun Maukum Fihad al Muattama. Uh, my name is uh, David Zigdon, and I am the CEO of Migal and the interim CEO of uh, Migvax. I have a strong background in the high tech industry, biomed, biotech, and the, the pharma startup industry. Before I joined Migal, I was the CEO and the president of, uh, of Rad Biomed, an Israeli based evergreen family fund that invest in early stage biomed startup uh, companies that I have founded, companies that I founded uh, have a value in uh, access to uh, $2 billion. So uh, Miguel, uh, Miguel is a multidisciplinary applied research institute located in the north part of Israel, uh, very close to the border. Uh, in uh, Lebanon, we have uh, we have non-profit institute. We have about 41 researchers with uh, 300 employees. Uh, in more, most uh, of about 100 PhD. Uh, the discipline that we are uh, doing here is uh, uh, plant science, uh, nutrition, biotechnology, soil, water, environment. And we have two service units in the post-harvest innovation center in North R&D that work with the agricultural very, very close. So based on the extensive work in developing in all the subunit vaccine for IBV, which is avian coronavirus, Miguel designed the vaccine, actually designed the system that can be adapted rapidly to virus mutation. Miguel has the opportunity to use this method to develop a, corona, a COVID-19 vaccine. Miguel established a fully owned subsidiary called Migvax LTD and gave Migvax an exclusive worldwide license to develop, manufacture, and commercialize vaccine for human and uh, viruses. So uh, as you can see, the researchers are an uh, interdisciplinary uh, vaccine development team, which has uh, extensive long-term experience in avian subunit vaccine, taking them from the idea to commercial success, and uh, they have already two vaccines in the market. The management team is uh, also uh, the consultant, uh, bring with them decades of experience in all aspects of human vaccine development, production, clinical, and uh, business. So uh, the question, will the chicken save the humanity uh, from COVID-19? So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the subunit vaccine that we developed, that is active vaccine and one slide about the passive immune vaccine that uh, actually Dr. Orovitz started to talk, that we are going to use a IGY, which is antibody from chicken. So uh, how all this story started. So four years ago, uh, with significant funding by the Israeli Ministry of Agriculture, we established a national center of excellence for viral vaccine. The center designed a subunit vaccine system that can be adapted rapidly to virus mutation. And as part of the project, Migal Research will develop a new oral subunit vaccine for IBV and avian coronavirus. In addition to IBV vaccine, we are currently working on other vaccines, influenza, Newcastle, and Rio virus. As you can see here, the IBV, it's very similar to the SARS-CoV-19 from the S structure of the protein. And uh, based on this information, we started to, uh, to design and develop our uh, vaccine. So how our vaccine is built, uh, I'm not going to uh, repeat what uh, Dr. Orwitz uh, told us, uh, told us before, there is a spike and the, uh, there is a spike and we take part of the gene of the, the spike and fused it to a carrier. 
we take also a part of the new capsid, the N, the new capsid, uh, uh, the, the, this is the protein, the, the inside uh, of the virus, and use it to a, a carrier. By the way, it's uh, not, it's not, the, these two carriers are not fused, but it's the same carrier. So we combine all this uh, protein together, uh, and the combination of the three chimeric protein create our vaccine. The carrier protein penetrate the mucosal system and present the viral antigen to the immune system. So this approach induced three arm of, uh, in, of immunological response. First, it, the mucosal immunity because it uh, penetrates via the mucosal, uh, the mucosal system. Second, the systemic immunity, IgG, that uh, most of, actually most of the vaccine in the world uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, systemic immunity and also the cell-mediate uh, immunity what, that we are uh, doing by uh, activating the T cells. In the next few slides, I'm going to present you uh, the uh, experiment that we have done uh, uh, with, uh, with the uh, animals. And, uh, and this one, uh, I told you about the experiment that before the COVID-19 uh, uh, showed up, we started with the IBV. So uh, the experiment done on chicken, which is, uh, they are not the animal model actually, the, they are the model. And uh, we gave to the chicken oral vaccine in day zero, after that in the day 21 and booster in day 30. On day 45, we uh, exposed the chicken to massive amount of uh, virus, of IBV virus. It's much massive that it could, be, could uh, get from, uh, you know, from the regular uh, condition. And then after it, we, in the, you know, in the professional it's called challenge, we challenge them with the IBV, and we measure, uh, we take samples uh, by squad uh, from the cloaca and the hair, three days after the challenge, six days after the challenge, and 10 days after the challenge. And here is the result. I'm not going about all the bar, but uh, this is the control, and uh, this is the S1, actually, the most of the vaccine currently using S1. And this is our vaccine, the combination of the two protein with S1. As you can see here, uh, this is uh, the results of uh, viral shedding, uh, of uh, viral shedding samples, uh, SWOT taken from the both cloaca and trachea measured by quantities uh, in the PCR. The, and you, here you can see the antibody killed uh, the viruses. So from S1, after three days, there is, and the, by the way, this is a, a log bar. After three days, there are a lot, almost the same as the control group. You know, there is a massive viral uh, in the cloaca and the trachea. And you see uh, about uh, one log uh, decrease in uh, day six and dramatically decrease uh, on day 10. However, if you look at our uh, uh, vaccine, with this combination, after three days, you see almost reduction of two logs. It's almost 99% of, uh, of the viral shedding from the uh, uh, from the chicken from the uh, from the cloacea and trachea and after six days there is almost no virus in the chicken. The next slide we show the uh, the amount of the, the the actually the percentage of the chicken positive to viruses. Uh, so, so in the S alone you see. 
it's almost the same as the control after three days and after six, six days, like they get uh, no vaccine and dramatically decrease uh, in day 10. However, in our solution, after three days, you can see a 15% reduction. And after a six days, 77% uh, reduction. This is very important uh, uh, results because reduction in carrier of the chicken reflect the reduced spreading of the viruses in the community. And this is give us a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, 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 we feel very comfortable, a lot of comfortable uh, to go to human. So here you can see uh, the slide that we did some experiment in the mammals, as you, see, as you, as you know, uh, the, the, the regulatory not accept any chicken, they uh, like to see mammals. So we took the IBV vaccine and gave it to mice. And here also you can see the increase, the combination increase our uh, IgG. In the next slide, you, we measure the IgA. So we wash uh, from the lung. So we wash the lung and we see the IgA. And it's very, very important to see in our vaccine the amount of IgA. When we took the S1 and subcutaneed to the, the mice, you see the level of the IgA. So our vaccine gives actually tremendous, it's really a high level, very high level uh, of IgA. Uh, which you are not seeing in a vaccine based on S1 only. So we continue our, uh, and this is, by the way, it's uh, this experiment is an ongoing experiment. We are uh, doing, uh, give all COVID-19 vaccine to mice. And he is after the booster, 10 days after the booster, you see the level of the IgG and 10, uh, 20 days after the booster, you see increased dramatically the level of IgG. And this is very, very important. As, as I said, this is very, very initial results. We don't have a, this experiment is ongoing. And the next we like to see uh, what is the level of the IgG, if it's continue to increase the level of IgG. And uh, of course we can uh, check the level of IgA as uh, we did uh, with the uh, uh, IBV vaccine, but in order to do it, we have to sacrifice the mice. So uh, if I'd like to summarize this part, we are talking about uh, subunit oral vaccine and for administration of oral, oral vaccine, it's much uh, easier to administrate than you know, especially when we are talking in, with development country, you don't need nurse to uh, give the oral subunit vaccine. When you're talking uh, of children, is uh, uh, also a, a very, uh, very good access to them to give them a, a oral vaccine. Uh, from the experiment that uh, we showed that it's very effective, uh, especially uh, from, from the mucosal IgA and the, from the systemic IgG and from the cellular. It's really relatively safe when you give uh, oral vaccine is uh, much safer. Uh, giving a three chimeric uh, protein uh, via oral, it's relatively uh, safe. Uh, the, it's, we are, we are uh, producing uh, the vaccine in E. coli production. So E. coli production is well-known production and relatively a low cost. And then um, what's more important, uh, as I uh, uh, emphasized in the beginning, our vaccine based on uh, uh, chemical uh, comp uh, computational uh, chemistry that we, uh, when uh, a mutation show up, it's really, really fast to adapt. And by, by the way, from the, from the day we started, we uh, look at a lot, a lot, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, mutation of the COVID-19 and we, uh, at this point in time, we didn't uh, see that we have to adapt uh, our solution, our vaccine to the new mutation. 
so we also doing, and this is uh, exactly what uh, Dr. Horowitz said, we also doing a, a passive uh, immune system based on IgY. IgY is similar to IgG in human. So uh, just now uh, uh, the FDA approved treatment by antibody to, uh, to human who infected the, by the uh, virus. So uh, the current solution uh, for antibody uh, utilized human antibody or monoclonal antibody, uh, relatively it's uh, both uh, very expensive and uh, we are coming with a solution and this is really, really an early, early stage. Uh, ba- we have a solution based on IgY that uh, IgY is uh, dissimilar to IgG that extract from eggs. Yeah. So uh, the problem uh, in this case that antibody from animal uh, sources are limited by human immune response to animal antibody. So what uh, our scientists in Miguel have developed a masking system a masking system, MBA, for IgY chicken antibody. And actually we have done uh, some experiment in mammals. Uh, this, uh, my own, uh, this is uh, MBA can protect the IgY antibody from uh, mammalian immune system. This may enable long-term PK of the injected IgY uh, as well as uh, following multiply injection without causing any immune response. So advantage is, as I said, IgY you extract from egg yolk, and this is relatively uh, cheap. The cost per dose estimate at this point in time, and this is really, uh, as I said, in early stage, could be around between uh, 10 to 15 uh, dollar per dose is, uh, versus uh, thousands of dollar of the uh, current solutions. Uh, each egg can lay about one egg a day. Uh, with a human dose, uh, we are estimated that it will be 1.5 to two eggs. And this is uh, still uh, should be uh, terminated. So uh, we come uh, again to the question. Does or will the chicken save the immunity from COVID-19? Thank you very much uh, for listening. Wow. Thank you so much for being on time. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mr. David. Um, that was really enlightening. I, I, I love this uh, three uh, immune responses. That was really very interesting, very interesting. Thank you so much. I think... Uh, uh, we will pass to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Melita uh, Bujinovic. Um, and she is uh, a WHO rep- representative and head of country office at WHO Russian Federation. I think she is uh, she's here. Yes, I am. Good afternoon, good evening, um, and thank you for inviting me. Hello. Hello. <laughs> you are most, uh, most welcome. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. I think you are going to cover the uh, topic of the role of WHO diplomatic representatives as facilitators to regulators and manufacturers. Wow, that's a big, a big task. Uh, good luck and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, Let me try to share my screen uh, with the presentation. Uh, We hope that it will be useful to actually present uh, the role of the World Health Organization uh, in uh, the entire uh, process. Uh, Give me just one second, I'm sorry. As usual, WHO has a number of uh, presentations on board. So, uh, too many to handle. Yes, here we are. Yeah. Absolutely. 
So thank you once again. And uh, in discussions, uh, in preparation, of course, on the technical role and on the national regulatory authorities in this process, when we have a pandemic available, my colleagues from the headquarters would have been much, I would say, better suited. But uh, having in mind uh, that the World Health Organization has one of the largest presences, field presences of the United Nations in the world in this unprecedented situation when the aim is uh, to make available the global goods that will be developed to everyone in need and especially in the time of the sustainable development goals when we want to achieve that no one is left behind I think that it might be useful to clarify how the WHO offices in countries and the WHO representative, the diplomatic representative, uh, can uh, facilitate and help all the multiple players at the moment. Um, this is a short overview of the presentation. Allow me to start with the statement of our director general that the ultimate measure of WHO success is not the number of reports that we publish or the meetings we hold, but the difference we can contribute to make to the health of the world's people. And our 13th general program of work and the sustainable development goals are actually closely intertwined and lead us to this. Uh, the WHO core functions, I'm sure you all know well because they are embedded in our constitution. It is the providing leadership, some matter, matters critical to health. Uh, it is shaping the research agenda and stimulating the generation, translation and dissemination of knowledge. It is the norms and standards. Uh, it is the articulating the ethical and evidence-informed policy options, which are now a critical uh, time not only for ministers of health, but actually for prime ministers, for presidents, because the leadership of the pandemic uh, of unprecedented scales is actually now very much in the political leadership of the countries. It is, of course, uh, our bread and butter, which is providing technical support, catalyzing change and building sustainable institutional capacities. And it is also monitoring the health situation and assessing the health trends, but also health needs. If you're talking about the World Health Organization, again, facts that you know, 194 member states in six regions, but we have 149 country offices. Uh, this is um, actually taken from the report. You can see um, the file below. But, uh, and we can send it to you, the report is available to everybody to see exactly what does WHO have in the countries. We are very proud and in the European region because WHO has six regions. Um, in January, 2019, we have opened the country office in Greece. Uh, and this is an additional office. There has never been an office there. This has been at the request of the government and Ministry of Health received by WHO in 2018. Uh, we have around 4,000 staff members. Uh, half of them are professionals, whether international or national. And we are constantly increasing the ratio of professional to administrative staff. However, we have to highlight that our administrative staff is extremely valuable because it's not administration per se. It is support to the programs. It is support to the governments. It is support to our partners. Uh, the WHO headquarters in Geneva and our six regional offices are providing constant technical backstopping because unlike many other agencies, we do not concentrate all the technical capacity uh, in the countries. We are actually using economies of scale so that we can pull from all levels of the organization technical capacities which might be needed. And of course, uh, we are following what our governing body is uh, requesting from us. And this is to increase uh, the allocations uh, to the country of our budget. So 79% of our planned costs have been for the previous biennium for the countries, although we are having a major gap in resources, as everybody knows, and 60% of our actual funds have been allocated to countries. 
This is a map uh, showing actually the location of the six regional offices, the six regions and our country offices, and I'll not go into details on that. We also have countries without uh, country offices. Uh, and uh, collaboration with these countries is also very intensive, but it goes directly with the regional office or with headquarters. Um, this is uh, uh, an overview. You can see that in four regions, there are countries which do not have a country office presence, and two regions have all countries uh, with country offices. In the European region, uh, of course, you can see that some countries have been highlighted with different colors. And this is because with these countries, we have a sort of a presence. Uh, for example, our regional offices in Denmark, uh, we have uh, geographically dispersed offices, which are parts of our regional office that are financed by the uh, donor country in that country. For example, we have that in Italy. We have that in Germany. I apologize, I have missed that. This is in Germany, our environmental office. In Italy is our office for um, health equity. Uh, we have two more countries which also have a country office where we have such a presence. This is Kazakhstan with the office for the primary health care, our original office for primary health care, our regional center, and Moscow with, in addition to the country office that I am leading, uh, we have an office for non-communicable diseases. We also have countries uh, which uh, have uh, specific country cooperation strategies with WHO disregarding the fact that these are upper middle income or high income countries like Belgium, for example, Switzerland. So we have a variety of presence and interactions. What is actually the role of the WHO country office? And it's sometimes not really looked at. Um, it's a lot. Across all our six core functions, it's articulating policy options, it's providing leadership, technical support and capacity building, leading on emergency response. We have responded to more than 600 various emergencies over the last biennium. It is leading WHO's work in monitoring and evaluating national policies and programs, informing WHO and vice versa. It's setting norms and standards. And what would be the topic that we are now most interested in is what is the role of the country office in shaping the research agenda. It is definitely the promotion of research and strengthening research capacities in countries. Uh, and there is a lot of research going on at the moment. For example, our solidarity trial, which is happening in many countries, um, is, has the aim to provide the necessary information, evidence-based, uh, collected under one roof uh, to enable to distinguish which treatments will be most effective and make a difference in the COVID pandemic. Uh, we are, of course, now looking at the other solidarity trials for vaccines and for other things. It is also supporting and where appropriate conducting operational research. Uh, it is not uh, WHO doing it by itself. It is with a plethora of national partners and international partners, and often there are various consortia, uh, which are actually uh, supporting the countries either to enter the global health field or to easier exchange uh, various research initiatives. And as uh, an ultimate result, it is contributing to the body of knowledge on best practices. Uh, the 149 country offices are led by WHO representative, as I have indicated, the diplomatic representative, because we all are there with the agreement of the host government, but we are selected through a vigorous process of assessment centers, and we have various terms of serving in the countries. Uh, the WHO representative has two uh, supervisors or two superiors. It is uh, the regional director as the first level uh, supervisor and actually we are directly appointed by the director general. Uh, we are the most senior WHO staff member at the country level with the delegation of authority to lead negotiations or to facilitate urgent diplomatic, technical, um, and other uh, collaboration. We are responsible for a number of issues. We have to deliver various policy, technical, political, diplomatic, 
managerial and advocacy roles. Uh, the offices are of various size, especially in various regions, and this is why it is very important that the WHO representative can easily and quickly mobilize support needed, whether it is from the headquarters or from the regional office. Of course, we also have inter-regional collaboration. However, uh, that is an area where we are trying uh, definitely to do more. Once you speak to a WHO representative, whether in the country where you are or another one, you are actually at the so-called one-stop shop where you are immediately having access to the cabinet of the director general because we report immediately and we follow up so that the countries that we serve or other countries that have approached us have a quick access uh, to the resources. Uh, during the uh, pandemic, um, as you know, the pandemic, actually the uh, public health emergency of international concern, let us go back to the international health regulations as the convention, the international treaty that is regulating all WHO work uh, in uh, such a, an emergency situation has been declared at the end of January 2020. Um, immediately after the etiological agent uh, causing the new respiratory disease has been isolated and the first genomic sequence has been completed. Um, and immediately after that, scientific and academic institutions and manufacturers started to work together on the development of COVID-19 vaccines. Um, of course, this has been an unprecedented situation, an unprecedented effort by the World Health Organization and its partners to bring together all this knowledge and to speed up the development of the uh, vaccines, but not only vaccines, also of effective treatments, because unfortunately, uh, even uh, antiretrovirals or other medicines that have been available uh, for other diseases have never been tested on the new uh, disease. And this chronology of facts, where we have the public health emergency of international concern, and after that research starting, is actually shaping the situation. And uh, the regulatory bodies are very much uh, actually looking at this new unprecedented situation, because all the regulators in the world, in the world are looking now at their legislation, at the regulation, and at WHO, how this can be done. Um, Basically, we are guided by the global program of work, which is defining a lot of things by the country cooperation strategies um, and by biennial programs of work. And at this moment, when the pandemic hit in, I would like to give you a short account of the case study, how and what was the role in Russia and what are we doing actually. So while with the Russian Federation, the collaboration is primarily uh, collaboration, not technical support or assistance, because the country has graduated uh, as a program country um, earlier uh, in this century, in 2011. Uh, the presence of the World Health Organization is primarily to strengthen the country capacity for global and regional collaboration in health. Uh, multilateral under the WHO roof, but also fostering various bilateral uh, collaboration that are leading uh, to scientific progress. Uh, it is, of course, also looking at creating an environment conducive to health promotion, disease prevention, aiming at universal health coverage during life course, strengthening capacity for health security, and this is exactly the situation where we are in, and strengthening the health system performance, again, for universal health coverage. Why am I underlining universal health coverage? Because unless we manage to get the necessary medical products, uh, vaccines, other biologicals, medicines needed to uh, treat people uh, with COVID-19, uh, we have collectively failed because it's not only WHO as the secretariat, it's all of us together uh, living in these unprecedented times. So what has been the role um, since the pandemic start. Early on, actually, the office has started mapping the country research activities on vaccine, encouraging and facilitating information for the WHO landscaping. Uh, although Russian is a um, WHO and United Nations official language, sometimes when it comes to the technical cooperation, 
there are certain delays uh, or hesitancy by developers or producers. By constant daily um, contact with the Ministry of Health and with the National Regulatory Authority, uh, we have managed to encourage uh, as soon as possible, the listing, the uploading of available uh, documentation, uh, information on where Russia is with its huge scientific potential in the development of various uh, technologies, uh, diagnostics, uh, vaccines, and therapeutics with regard to COVID. Uh, we are talking about the uh, emergency uh, listing of uh, various uh, products that are needed uh, during uh, the uh, public health emergency. And this is a very specific moment. Uh, it happened several times in the past. If you remember, of course, the swine flu pandemic um, had uh, sort of launched uh, the EUL um, as a very important mechanism. Many regulators in the world, as you have uh, indicated in the scope and purpose of this uh, symposium, uh, are looking at specific situations, emergency situations where uh, products, medical products may be needed, uh, having a shorter procedure uh, by being to become available to those in need while not uh, cutting on the uh, safety and efficiency considerations. If you're looking at the Russian Federation, one of the role of the country office and the representative is uh, to make sure that we have a full mapping of national legislation and regulations to inform the relevant departments in the World Health Organization Secretariat, whether it's the regional office or uh, headquarters. And by that, we know that in April, the government of Russia has uh, brought um, the decision that COVID-19 is considered an especially dangerous pathogen, which is then triggering the existing legislation and regulation on necessary uh, measures uh, that include conditional licensing of eventual products, medical uh, products or biologicals, uh, with requirements that the research through the clinical trial is continued even if the product is made available for urgent uh, life-saving procedures. Uh, of course, Russia has immediately also, uh, through the WHO office, uh, declared its wish to join uh, various um, initiatives. One of that is the Solidarity Trial 1, which is in process on uh, medicines. Uh, it has informed WHO headquarters on the national protocols of treatment, the standard of treatment, uh, which has since uh, January actually gone through eight versions. Uh, it's including new and experimental treatments, including, uh, including use of plasma, uh, of recovalescence or other uh, treatments. Uh, it is also using uh, some of the medicines that have been produced by Russia. And uh, we do hope that they will share the information on a wider scale uh, for um, various WHO uh, initiatives, scientific initiatives. It has facilitated technical discussions with various Russian experts on all uh, areas, including on registration for clinical trials. It has facilitated participation of Russia in WHO missions to support countries in response uh, to COVID. Uh, for example, our mission to Tajikistan um, has been possible thanks uh, to support from the Russian Federation, both uh, in personnel, in transport, in laboratory uh, equipment and laboratory experts. Uh, also, Russia has bilaterally provided a lot of support to various countries on response to COVID. Uh, and of course, what the role of the office has been, while we are so massively talking about vaccine and vaccination, uh, it is to monitor and to support the government in influencing the population uh, perception, attitude, and possible uptake of a new vaccine, because five, we are- Five minutes, five minutes, please. Thank you. Yes, all over the world, uh, various uh, resistance to vaccines. Um, at the moment, what Russia has is 17 vaccines under development, 10 are on the WHO landscape, two vaccines have entered clinical trials. 
Um, one vaccine has conditional licensing, national conditional licensing under the pandemic regulations, and this is the so-called Sputnik V vaccine. Uh, and uh, we are expecting now uh, more reports from the Vector Institute. Vector Institute is one of the two institutes in the world where the smallpox vaccine um, virus repository is held. Um, we continue to facilitate contacts with the Ministry of Health, the National Regulatory Authority, developers and industry with the WHO. And we are building on previous work with the National Regulatory Authority, which has fully uh, fully been declared fully functional by WHO uh, because Russia is producing a pre-qualified vaccine. It's the yellow fever vaccine. Uh, so you have here um, practically a summary of the role of the WRs, of the WHO representatives to achieve universal health coverage. But our main aim is leaving nobody behind. And this is why we are advocating and hoping also that the Russian Federation will also enter the COVAX and other WHO initiatives and mechanisms to ensure a fair distribution of the potential vaccine. Um, the question now is whether a pre-qualification, which requires a lot of process, uh, and Russia has announced that they are interested in pre-qualification, or just going for the emergency uh, list of products that might be used under the uh, pandemic. Thank you so much for your um, attention, and you can see uh, our slide, which is actually from the biggest uh, social network in Russia, the Russian Facebook, so-called Kontakte, where we have more than uh, 17 million views on some of the posts we are posting in Russian, which one of our major role is also to keep the Russian population public informed about WHO uh, messages, technical documentation and other issues. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, that was enlightening and clear, uh, crystal, crystal clear, uh, dear uh, Dr. Melita Vajonich. Indeed. Uh, thank you so much. Um, um, the floor now is to uh, Dr. Nawal El Kaabi. Welcome, Dr. Nawal. Uh, she's a chief medical officer of, uh, of a pediatric infectious disease consultant. She's the chair of the CEHA Infection Control Committee, Sheikh Khalifa Medical City, United Arab Emirates. Uh, she will be covering the topic of the inactivated SARS-CoV-2 phase three trail vaccine. Dr. Uh, uh, Nawal, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes and again, I will tell you uh, five minutes before your time is over, please. Evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ziad, for the introduction, and I'm honored to be part of this excellent symposium. Uh, can you see my slides? We see your slide, but we, we need also to hear your voice. Okay. Can you hear me? That's better. Thank you. Thank you. But, okay. So I will share with you the UAE experience with uh, phase three uh, inactivated uh, vaccine. Um, as a lot of you heard that uh, there is an agreement between uh, UAE, which is actually inspired by UAE leadership vision and commitment to overcome the pandemic through global collaborative efforts. Uh, the agreement was signed between Chinese pharmaceutical giant Sinopharm and Group 42 Healthcare. Uh, the Group uh, 42 Healthcare uh, are leading the phase three clinical trial of COVID-19 inactivated vaccine in Abu Dhabi. Uh, the clinical trials are being conducted under the strict guidance and supervision of the Ministry of Health and uh, Prevention, Department of Health of Abu Dhabi and Saha, the Abu Dhabi Health Service Company. The trials are following all international guidelines uh, stipulated by the World Health Organization and the United States Food and Drug uh, Authority. And this follow a successful phase one and phase two trial by Sinopharm in China, resulting in 100% of volunteer generating antibodies. At the present, no vaccine is available or approved uh, worldwide to prevent COVID-19. 
And according to the public report, since the rapid spread of the epidemic as of June 1st, no less than 118 component and scientific research institution around the world are developing nearly 100 novel coronavirus vaccine projects. And I think by now it's even more than that. Vaccine products uh, mainly include recombinant protein vaccine, inactivated vaccine, viral vector vaccine, DNA vaccine, and mRNA vaccine. I think some of you already saw this publication in JAMA um, about the effect of inactivated vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 uh, safety and immunogenicity outcome. This is the result of phase one and phase two of the inactivated vaccine that are developed by Sinopharm. So uh, this is summarized. Uh, in phase one, there was 96 participants were assigned to one of the three doses group uh, versus placebo. And uh, in phase two, 224 adults were randomized uh, also to different uh, doses uh, versus placebo. In conclusion, uh, the patient actually had uh, minor side effects, and there was no uh, major side effect or significant side effect. Uh, the side effect was expected with an activated uh, vaccine, and the most common side effect was pain uh, at the site of the injection and fever. Uh, the study is still ongoing. So Dr. if you look Ayo, at this, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. If can, you look Peter, can you make it a full uh, uh, full screen, yes. please? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. Good. Okay. Thank you. So, if you look at the study design of phase three, uh, the primary objective is to evaluate the protective efficacy against the COVID nineteen of inactivated SARS CoV two vaccine after two doses of the immunization in healthy subjects aged eighteen years and above. Uh, we are testing two types of strains. Both are inactivated versus placebo. Of course, it's randomized double-blinded placebo, controlled clinical trial. The immunization schedule two doses, zero, uh, day zero and day 21. And day 21, there is a window period of plus seven days. So anywhere between 21 to 28 days after the sec uh, first dose. In terms of lab testing, we are doing COVID-19 PCR that is required for all volunteers and blood samples for neutralizing antibodies. Uh, it's collected before the vaccination day 14 and day 28. And there are a, a subset of group of volunteers. We will collect the samples at uh, uh, three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months. If we look at the immunogenicity endpoint is to evaluate fourfold increase of GMT and GMI 14 days and 28 days uh, after the course of immunization. The primary in, uh, point protective uh, effect against COVID-19 14 days after the full course of vaccination among healthy population and all confirmed cases will be examined by DCMB independent uh, board. The secondary endpoint is to evaluate the protective uh, effect of, uh, of the vaccine uh, in preventing severe cases of SARS-CoV-2, pneumonia, and death. And the exploratory endpoint is to explore the protective uh, uh, level of antibodies neutralizing uh, against uh, SARS-CoV-2. In terms of uh, endpoint safety, uh, the, to observe the incidence of any adverse reaction or events within 30 minutes after each dose, to observe the incidence of adverse ev events within seven days uh, after each dose, and to observe the incidence of serious adverse events from the beginning of the first dose to 12 months after the whole course of the immunization. What we are doing to monitor all the side effects, we are doing, uh, trying to capture every possible side effect. We have telephonic consultation. Each, vac each volunteer received four calls post vaccine, uh, each vaccine, and we go through uh, 
a, a set of signs and symptoms almost from head to toe to capture any possible side effects. We are also monitoring all the emergency uh, visits and we are asking all emergency physicians or primary physician to email us for any possible vaccine adverse uh, events. And we share the email with all our uh, ED and primary health care clinics. We are also uh, getting a daily report to look for COVID-19 uh, positive cases among the immunized uh, patients. Plus we have a hotline and we receive any query or concerns. If you look at the project highlights, what really make the project uh, is successful um, is the collaboration between different stakeholders and the support that we received from our uh, government and leadership. Uh, we, what we did actually, we assigned not only a principal investigators, but also a lead in every area. So there is a lead in operation in clinical flow, pharmacy, data, laboratory, uh, IT, uh, nursing, and all we are working together as one team. And uh, it really helped that having a lead and working together, um, we managed to open one of the largest sites clinical sites uh, in the Middle East and probably one of the largest in the world, as we can see over a thousand, one to one, one to 2000 per day uh, volunteers in ADNIC. And uh, we learned a lot during COVID uh, when we opened our field hospital and that was very helpful for us to establish a clinical uh, trial with the... So what we learned is the trial success is uh, inspired, of course, by UAE leadership vision and commitment to overcome the pandemic through a global collaborative efforts. And uh, phase three is going very well. Uh, we managed to recruit more than 15,000 people uh, in Abu Dhabi, plus others in uh, other sites. I think we have it. All, we have other sites within UAE. We have another site in Bahrain and. Uh, we are planning to open sites in different countries. Uh, running field hospital during the pandemic uh, uh, brought the team the ability to, op uh, to operate the clinical site in a very effective way. Uh, there is a significant number of volunteers demonstrate that the trial have a high chance of efficacy and show uh, a wide uh, range of demographics. Uh, we managed to recruit uh, 118 nationalities. As you know, UAE, uh, we have so many nationalities and everyone is willing to participate, uh, hoping that one day we'll be able to end this pandemic. And the clinical trial shed some light on the level of frustration that was clearly a reason behind most of the volunteers. Uh, they want to go back to their life and they are looking at vaccine as a hope uh, in going back to their normal life. The side effects so far, so far are minor and within the expected range, which was one of the driver to achieve the greater number of volunteers. And of course, proper alignment, planning and communication among the key functional leads contribute to the success of this uh, trial. Uh, we are doing daily huddle uh, with all the functional leads and we um, manage uh, on, on time any challenges or issues within uh, the clinical trials. Of course, it is too early to judge on the efficacy. We are uh, recruiting and we, are, we start already to give uh, our second dose. And once we start to uh, have results, uh, we'll share it with, uh, with the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nawal. Uh, that was uh, top on time. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, our next speaker as a part of the uh, second session on uh, protocols and uh, processes involved in drug uh, development and vaccine development, uh, we have uh, an honor to to have uh, Dr. Andrew Elnatan, Senior Director, Regulator, Regulatory Affairs. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Senior Director, Regulatory Affairs, uh, International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. 
from the United States of America, and he will be covering uh, the topic, topical issues in COVID-19 vaccine development and approval. Uh, there, Andrew, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, Dr. Ziad. And, and thank you to all the colleagues on this panel. I, I, I found your talk actually very enlightening and very encouraging. It's, it's nice to see a lot of uh, development outside the U.S. as well, because my work is primarily focused on, on, on things that are more U.S. centric, but I'm glad to see that there are a lot of other works outside. Um, just a brief background about myself. I'm trained as a pharmacist. I work with the, Inter with the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, and one of my pr program is a vaccine collaboration with, with Merck. And I, I also work with, uh, with Dr. Jill Harwitz to help out on, on the monoclonal antibody program. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, hopefully, you can see it soon. Hang on. This is going to be a... Uh, all right. I need to find it first. All right, here we go. Can you make it full screen, please? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Is that better now? Yeah. Okay. Clear? Thank you so much. Okay. Firstly, just a quick disclosure. You know, um, because I was asked last minute, I'm, I'm not representing any company that I worked for or I'm working with, no any product or government. All the views that I express are purely mine, and I where possible, I try to source all my information from data and information that are already in a public domain. And you'll see that all my talks, all my presentations are, are linked and referenced. So if I pass these, these slide set around to the organizers, you, you can always click on the different links to, to, to read things yourself. And I'm going to take a quick step back. You know, this, this will be more, uh, uh, an informal presentation, and and I hope, and I realize that I'm between the all the technical presentations to the question. So uh, this should be a nice set of uh, issues that I present that would nicely lead into the discussions are afterwards. Um, so for those of us who still don't know <laughs> what may be going on, you know, this this coronavirus. Is, is actually a family of seven that could infect humans. And I've listed them there, four of which are, uh, of course, a common cold and three of the recent, you know, pandemic, epidemic include SARS-CoV, the first one, the MERS-CoV, which is still in circulation in, in, um, in, in the Middle East. And of course, our, our recent pandemic with the SARS-CoV-2. There's no currently no treatment or vaccine for 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 any of the coronavirus infection, which I think is an important point that people forget. So this this effort, this entire global effort to find the vaccine and treatment for SARS-CoV-2, if successful, will be a, a, a huge milestone for everybody. Uh, we all know that SARS-CoV COVID-2 used primarily the ACE2 receptor, and those, those of us in the medical field know that the, that the ACE2 is part of the angiotensin renin um, pathway, which is responsible for vasoconstriction and vasodilatation. And those of us who have hypertension may actually be taking drugs that 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 actually act on this pathway. It's, it's important to know too that um, there are other proteins that the virus can actually use in order to enter cells. And I've just listed, listed those there for, for those of us who wish to know a little bit more. There's a link there that you can look more into. And of course, a vaccine talk wouldn't really be a vaccine talk unless I go back to the origin of vaccination, which is uh, Dr. Jenner, who realized and discovered that um, if, if, you can, if you can inject uh, a related 
cousin of 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 smallpox, which is cowpox, um, to 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 a member of 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 the public, you can induce immunity by the fact that um, that that the related uh, virus actually stimulates the immune response, but without the without the disadvantage of of the real virus causing the disease. And of course, the WHO uh, ran and led a very successful smallpox e eradication campaign back in 1958 and was successfully eradicated in May 8th, 1980. Now, the significant fact of that is that it took 22 years um, while we're trying to hopefully eradicate the small uh, the the COVID-19 virus by you know within two years hopefully. Uh, Dr. Horowitz has had gone through this so you know this is just just another cartoon representation of representation of the two adaptive immune responses that are needed in order for uh, any vaccine to be relatively successful. Um, one note here is is I want to point out, you know, that that the the older people, usually those above sixty year old, may have this condition called immunosenescence, where their immune system isn't as good. So it's well and good to try and raise antibodies or to elicit uh, cellular immunity, but in older People, which unfortunately is 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 the more vulnerable population that is affected by by the SARS-CoV-2, you know this this type of immune response may not be as good as in younger as as in the younger population. Now, developing ch vaccines can be extremely challenging, um, and the examples here that I f found, unfortunately, you know affect children but you know which which we all love and dear and which which we all dearly love but it highlights sort of the issues that 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 um sort of keep some people awake at night when they're developing vaccines against COVID-19 in 1955 you know we had the SOC innovate inactivated polio vaccine and the cutter incident 1966 we had the RSV and more recently 2016 with Ding, ding vaxia, which 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 um you know affect a lot more children. So the question we have to ask here is, you know, have regulatory agencies learned the lessons of the past to ensure quality and safety and efficacy of upcoming COVID nineteen vaccines? Well, the FDA has certainly con considered this, and they they've um, produced a very well known guidance now, which which I think is sort of the template for a lot of other regulatory agencies back in June 2020. And there they have mandated, you know, a lot of criteria and recommendation on, on how a phase three should be done. Now, the emphasis currently is to try and collect scientific data and clinical data from a phase three that's robust enough to lead to approval, even before issuing an, em an emergency use authorization, um, talks given by, by officers of the FDA, you know, and as well as the NIH, try to emphasize the need to collect good data before going to approval. So any of the emergency use authorization that, that you seriously in the press for convalescent plasma, for remdesivir would only be issued in the case of vaccine once the clinical trials, the phase threes are completed and you're just waiting for that time to get regulatory agencies to review the, the data and give final approval. Um, and as other colleagues have said on, on this panel, there are a lot of cooperation going on between the FDA, the EMA, the WHO, as well as a lot of other regulators, to to try and agree on what a phase three, what what data would be required to um to to lead to approval, and I think this is very very good, you know, 
it's a very good aspect of what's happened um, with the pandemic in that there's now more focus on collaborative thinking and harmonized thinking. But of course, reg regulators are just scientists and often sci scientists work under a political system of the country that they're in. So we see efforts in the US, for instance, for, for this Operation Warp Speed to try and bring a vaccine as quickly as possible. And you have to wonder, you know, do, do these political national operations, are they going to compromise the safety and efficacy of, of, of the upcoming vaccines? We know that um, the head of CBO, um, Peter March, this, this was back in, back in June, but I think recently he has also met, made a categorical remark that if, if, he, if he was forced or if they was forced to approve a vaccine er, earlier than when the data is ready, he, he will have no choice but to resign just to, just to signal that he has no confidence in the process or the data. So that's somewhat comforting for some of us who worry at night about you know whether we we can trust our regulators. Back in June, when I was creating some of this talk, there was already news about Russia trying to find a COVID nineteen vaccine by you know sooner than later. So there was already some you know concern around that. And more recently, I think it was last week, we have Sp Sputnik V, which is, I, I, I think my, my colleague, um, doc, Dr. Vrednovic, actually clarified that that was under some kind of emergency conditional authorization, which I think is comforting to know. Um, and even on the Sputnik V website here, the, there's a little blurb saying that Russia is to begin the COVID-19 vaccine trials on 40,000 people next week. Um, so, you know, this, this would be something that the FDA would not do, but we can see that that's just within the US. So other countries ob obviously can and, and has adopted a slightly different approach. And of course, a lot of the talk around town is that, um, you know, how, how, how good is this vaccine? And 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 if the data from I guess in the phase one and phase two can can really be trusted because nobody has seen that data outside of Russia. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the vaccines that are in development, but I have provided some link here. All of these links provided by the New York Times and the Guardian. Fierce Pharma, Politico.com are all free because they've opened their their knowledge base for people, you know, so that the public can keep up. Um, so I encourage you to to try and read those if you want the latest on where where the different vaccines are. But back in July, when I was looking through the data, I, and I haven't included the 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 Sinopharm. Data that 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 um, my colleague from 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 the UAE has just talked about, but if you look at the the four current uh, uh, the four leading vaccines, the data from their early trials, you can see that it's pretty good so far. So I think they're encouraging signs that 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 the vaccine, you know, sh we should be quite close to vaccine approval or, or, or at least the data that, that, that would indicate that we have an efficacious vaccine. What is worrying a little bit to me is that if you see, and this includes the Sinopharm data too, all of the trials that was done or, or published to date have been in the younger population. So you have the 18 to 59 here, 18 to 55 from, from Moderna, AstraZeneca, which is which I think a promising candidate vaccine, also 
up to 55 year old. The only data that we, that at least that I, when I was researching this on the older population came from the Ken Sino bio uh, phase, phase one, two, where they did include up to 83 year olds. And you can see here that their conclusion was that the antibody response in the older people um, is not as good as in the younger population. This, there's a thumbs down here, so if people can't see that. So they were the scientists involved there were surmising that they may be able to overcome this with a second dose because they 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 only um, um dose with 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 a single dose. A lot of these other uh, vaccine trials have actually looked at two doses, 14 days apart, 20 days apart, um, on but but on much much younger people. So I think. I believe most of the phase threes that are underway will will include um, older than 60 year old. So hopefully we will be able to get data out of them. And I want to leave this talk with some thought of, uh, about you know what what um, what is happening at least in the U.S. of A. And that is even if you even if manufacturers and sponsors come up with a vaccine, can the public can the American public Really, um, you know, will they have will will they have access to one? And there's an there's an article in the Atlantic that talks about the problem with you know shortages of 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 syringes, short, short shortages of needles, vials, you know, and and as well as questionable problems in the distribution of the vaccine, given that the administration in the U.S were not even able to to acquire personal protective equipment, um, ventilators, you know, or or to coordinate the the efforts within the states um, to try and get a uniform response. And and I think these are very valid questions. And I'm and I do like that uh, Dr. Zigdon presented his work, his company's work on an oral vaccine because I think that will you know if that were to work that would certainly be very fa favorable towards um, this issue of of whether other shortages will affect the availability of a vaccine um, and it's such a concern that um, you know this this whole thing about access that that the U.S. Congress actually held a held a hearing back in July, um, you know, encouraging I guess all of the CEOs in the um, in the big pharma world all pledged that they will be selling their vaccines at no profit. So uh, AstraZeneca, Moderna, J and J, and Pfizer, all 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 said that they would try to sell their vaccine at reduced cost or with no profit. But um, five minutes, please. Thank you. Yes, and I think there's still some skepticism around that. And lastly, you know, even if you can get a vaccine available, you know, one of the things that are happening in America is some of the surveys show that maybe. Uh, just 50% of Americans to maybe up to, you know, um, 50 to 70 percent would actually get a vaccine, even if it was available and made, you know, made available for free. So there's some, some interesting problems to overcome over here. <laughs> All right. So that's, so that ends my talk. And okay. I look forward to discussion and questions. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, that was really enlightening and uh, comprehensive. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate uh, the input of all uh, our distinguished speakers. We come uh, to the end of our uh, symposium. We have uh, plenty of questions from the floor. Uh, I think we will start, if you don't mind, uh, we will start with Dr. Uh, Melita. We are hitting uh, WHO with many questions, so I will start with uh, 
does COVAX Global Vaccine Facility managed by WHO, which has both the largest and most diverse COVID-19 vaccine portfolio in the world, has the pivotal role in advancement of vaccine research and do the major players in the world are part of it. Does the WHO has that power? Uh, WHO Secretariat and the Director General have reached out to various partners who are in the COVAX. And for the moment, we have uh, responses from more than 170 countries interested to be in the COVAX. And so is the response from various producers. However, there are, of course, parallel initiatives going on which are raising the concern that the vaccine availability and affordability uh, might affect the principle of leaving nobody behind. And this is something, this is really a question for the director general. Uh, we are working on that, we are advocating, and it will be as good as the member states actually stick to their word and work with us together, including and inviting all the producers to make available the necessary, I, we would say, first um, launch of the vaccine, first phase of the vaccine to bring the uh, pandemic under control. But we are optimistic on that one, especially with regard to the high level dialogue that is coming from the headquarters. Yeah, but this brings me to, the, to, to, to a related question. As there is no international body to police the distribution of vaccine doses. Once we got the vaccine this or next year, who is going to be in charge of delivering and distributing billions of vaccines in a way that is fair, equitable, simple, does not require refrigeration, and it could be administered in places where they don't have a real robust health system infrastructure. Can you elaborate on that, please? Indeed, another $1 million question. Uh, but uh, depoliticizing and bringing solidarity into the uh, whole situation will be critical. WHO is not a police force. It's not the Security Council. Uh, and if the member states stand behind strongly their words and manage to do the solidarity issue, especially for the countries that cannot afford it. That's going to be the critical part as well. Uh, also looking at the uh, overall capacity, the unprecedented uh, effort to bring all the researchers sort of to a common pool, whatever a common pool would need, uh, and estimating the capacity of the production will be critical. Uh, because the vaccines might be coming in at a different stage and who is going to be first, who is going to be first in the countries, how the countries will do that is going to be a critical thing. Again, something that the director general is now trying to negotiate at the highest level. And thank you for the question, because coming from me again directly, as I said, to the regional directors of EMRO and EURO and to the director general will be a critical question. Thank you so much. Uh, I will leave you in peace with the, with the last question. What is the risk? You are much requested, so you have a popularity among our viewers. What is the risk that a bidding war between governments for a vaccine supplies will mean that rich countries win and the poor lose? It's related to the third question. Uh, let me speak on my own behalf at the moment and not on behalf of WHO. But being in the World Health Organization for 25 years and in the United Nations, starting with peacekeeping for, um, forces um, a bit longer than that, I am an incurable optimist. And I do believe that the World Health Organization and uh, the UN will stand strong with those who need support. And this is, these are the poor. And I do believe that we are going to hear very strongly in the governing bodies uh, the issue, because that might really break our world if we go for that one. And I do hope we have mechanisms, joint solidarity mechanisms, uh, standing strongly and advocating. This is part of the work 
of every WHO representative at the moment to talk to the governments um, and to make sure that we handle this pandemic together. The costs, economic costs are huge at the moment of the COVID response. Everybody is aware of that. But if we would not have the response, if everybody would just let it go as it is, it would be even more costly because the health systems would break down as we have seen in many places. So this is uh, the moment for a new reality. This is not all those Huxley time. We have to think beyond that. It has to be a brave new world, but not according to his lines, but according to the Shakespeare's lines. So um, we will work on that one strongly with you, I hope, and with trends. Good luck for you there, really. That was a crystal clear and very useful. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate that. Uh, I will also uh, just uh, have another question to uh, uh, Mr. David. Uh, a lot of people are talking about phase one, phase two, phase three, you know, for the common people, we need to enlighten what is the vaccine testing process. Can you elaborate on that quickly and briefly, if you don't mind? Phase one is what? Preclinical is what? What's phase two? What does it have? Sometimes we hear it has 10 people, 100 people, 1,000. So all that make really a lot of confusion. Can you enlighten that, please? You put on sorry. your-, your Yeah, yeah, your sorry, mic. sorry. Okay, so I'd like to do it very fast. Uh, now we are uh, talking about fast track fast track in, 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 in vaccine. It's not in regular process that uh, we are facing. So we, uh, in the preclinical, you are doing experiment with uh, mice, usually in mice or, or big uh, species uh, like monkeys. But uh, at this point in time, after you show, and this is the regulation uh, from the EU and the WHO, if you show safety and the efficacy with uh, mice, you can go to first uh, in human, also for safety and get uh, and uh, as as the usual uh, vaccine giving to uh, healthy people. So uh, phase one is called phase one two because you give it also to healthy people. You like to see the antibody, the gain of the antibody in one and on the other end, you like to see the safety. And uh, in the fast track, after a, a four, a, after a few months, as you can go to phase two three, and this is most of the a, a, most of the company does. Uh, phase two three is much more a, a people. Uh, usually the size of phase one, uh, three, uh, phase one, two, depend on the group that you like to use, depend on the age of the people that you are uh, going to, uh, to have. And uh, usually it's uh, conducted by, uh, uh, by statistic people. They are uh, choosing the size of the group. Usually it could be between uh, 180 to 200 people. This is a good size that can give you good indication about the efficacy and about the safety. Phase two, three, it's much uh, higher. And also it depends on the results that other uh, company uh, does. So preclinical, we are talking about animal. Clinical trial is usually human. Uh, you try to give it to healthy human. Phase one, two, it's usually healthy human with no risk. Phase two, three, it's uh, much, uh, 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 the population is uh, much bigger and they are not only healthy human. You, it's not limited to age. You have to give it to uh, people older than uh, 55, etc. So this is, uh, in, in, you know, in one leg to explain uh, about uh, what we are doing. But also I have to say that it's very, very important. At the end of the day, you're giving vaccine to healthy people, not to uh, people who are sick. And uh, you should be very, very careful. And it doesn't matter, you know, what is the regulation and what is the WHO and the FDA say. At the end of the day, you are a manager of company. You take the res responsibility and you have at the end of the day to, uh, to sleep good. So we are as a person taking very, very carefully all the state. And uh, we like, you know, to be sure before we are entering to human to be sure that everything is fine and it's okay. Thank you. 
that were very short and simple, but deep and, and, and very useful. Thank you, David. Um, I will, uh, uh, there is a question for our uh, beloved Andrew. Uh, the Sputnik vaccine has created a lot of attention uh, from to, uh, media and uh, from critiques. Uh, it is very useful uh, vaccine, of course, but uh, critique about not passing the phase three clinical trial uh, went uh, viral on, on, on social media. Uh, was that part of uh, international competition? Uh, why the much politicization for this vaccine? Yeah, I, I, I think um, I think Melita could have some views to this too, <laughs> but I I believe given that that even the name was called Sputnik V. Somebody from outside uh, Russia, so we need you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think just just the fact that 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 the name is Sputnik V suggests that it is sort of you know the, there was some political push to it. Um, I wouldn't blame the Russian Fe Federation for naming it Sputnik V because it was the Americans who came up with op with Operation Warp Speed. And as you know, back back in the back in the '60s when there was this space race going on, you know, people people were using these terms, and 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 it was a matter of national pride and and political, you know, upmanship to try and see which system was was better at. Doing things, but I think at the end of the day, you know, I'm not sure that it's a service to the public to actually to provide too early an approval because the question would be, how do you complete a vaccine trial if you've actually given it approval up front? People may say, well, if it's approved, it must be safe. So I don't want it to, I don't want to enter into trial because I might get, I might be randomized to the placebo arm, which would may not be of an of any benefit to me. So I I think the Russian Federation may have done a slight disservice to actually demonstrating that the vaccine, you know, works. Okay. But Melita, <laughs> please. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Uh, okay. Yes, um, thank you. I am in Russia, but outside of Russia, so I represent yeah, WHO no in Russia, sure. and I'm not Russian. Um, indeed, WHO has been in very close contact, and as we have made clear in the statement, we have confirmation from the highest levels that all data will be shared. So until we have all the information, uh, we cannot say anything at this stage. Uh, it is important to understand that Russia knows the process of pre-qualification. Their yellow fever vaccine is fully pre-qualified. They have a fully functional national regulatory authority, and they have a very low mortality uh, that we have seen uh, in COVID because of an unprecedented, I was really pleasantly surprised with how they have used high tech at primary care for screening of every patient and uh, artificial intelligence to make sure that all those who might have even moderate disease go and get the assistance and care needed. So within that, I think, again, this is not on behalf of WHO, that they have been trying to make sure that they have available for 150 million population the necessary vaccine. They have already 50% coverage with influenza vaccine for three years in a row, which is amazing. So let us see. But WHO is very closely working with them to get all the data that they upload everything they have, not only from this Sputnik vaccine, but also from the Vector uh, Institute vaccine. They are going a bit slowlier, but uh, they are also having. If you look at the portfolio of Russian vaccines, they are across all the technologies that are at the moment used. This is a vector a vaccine based on the adenovirus, but they are using also the other ones, the recombinant. Um, Chumakov Institute goes for the inactivated whole, whole virion. So I think 
uh, getting everybody on the same platform to share the data, to share with the world, might depoliticize quite a lot. And I think the scientists have to have a say in that one, really, uh, to get to the science rather than politics. Okay, okay. And if I can add just, just, just one other parallel example recently is, is the emergency use authorization of convalescent plasma, which was also questioned by a lot of critics within the US as a politicized process. And there the, the FDA was actually somewhat more transparent in sharing the data, you know, even before and after the, the process, the agency wanted to actually uh, give the emergency use authorization. The NIH stepped in and said, maybe you shouldn't because, you know, we don't really have strong data. And in a few days later, the, uh, the FDA, well, President Trump announced that there was emergency use authorization, you know, so that, you know, we're kind of in the same boat as what happened with the Sputnik V in some ways. Yes, I think this uh, confusion about a lot of uh, vaccines and drugs, the same for hydrox hydroxychloroquine, uh, there is a lot of confusion. That brings me to the last question to our uh, Dr. Jill Horowitz. Uh, 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 the vaccine, I'm quoting, a vaccine in 12 months is, is, is a, a fake news. And they cited HIV, hepatitis B, and other uh, drugs that until now we don't have vaccine for. So are you going to really give us this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, vaccine? Uh, how truth are there? And then he said, you have to take care of the vaccine conspiracy theory. Uh, everybody now is talking about uh, this. It, 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 went, it went really viral that there will be an enforced vaccination uh, Mr. Bill Gates was the target of these rumors. They question his reason why he is investing a lot of money in this vaccine. They even suspected that he wants to implant, implant a chip in people through COVID-19 vaccine to check people out and control them. So Dr. Uh, uh, Jill, is there any truth in these vaccine conspiracy theories? And if, if we can uh, give a question for everybody, who is behind them? Is it or not a symptom of a crisis of trust? Well, I'll start with your last statement that yes, it is in fact a symptom of the crisis of trust. And I think, you know, that's really what we need to work on as a scientific community and as scientific educators is, you know, to really listen to the public and partner with the public um, to you know, to dissipate the distrust. And I, I can give you a recent example of um, what happened here in the US and, and in particular in New York City, um, where within the last couple of years, um, the Orthodox Jewish community um, in, in and around New York City was targeted by the anti-vaccination movement. Um, you know, for, for reasons, um, partly, I, I think partly um, because this is a community that is, you know, very, um, very much deliberately not in touch with the rest of society and therefore in many ways easier to target. And so information was given to the community that undermined trust in vaccines, especially for children and babies. And the rates of um, vaccination against measles, mumps, and rubella dropped precipitously in this community and children and babies got sick. And there was a real concern, you know, there are individuals in, who, who cannot get MMR because it's a live vaccine. And so they, these individuals who are adults and are very often um, sick adults, they depend upon herd immunity in order to pr prevent the diseases from circulating in the community. So there are people who um, cannot be vaccinated and they depend upon those who can be vaccinated. Among those are healthy, normal children and babies. So in a population um, that where, you know, where vaccination drops beyond a certain level, uh, not only do do the, the vaccinees, potential vaccinees get sick, but 
also um, people who really depend on herd immunity get sick and often have very severe adverse reactions adverse events related to the acquisition of these diseases. And this became um, an, a known problem in the New York City area. And the way that it was addressed, and it was actually addressed successfully, was uh, there were a number of members of the Orthodox community who worked in the health professions. Uh, they worked, there, were, there was a woman who worked across the street from me at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And they took it upon themselves to educate their own community. And because they were trusted in their own community, they were successful and vaccination rates went back up and uh, the problem essentially went away. Having said that, as you said, vaccination, you know, anti-vaccine um, sort of ideas are a conspiracy theory. And with conspiracy theories, facts alone will never succeed because by nature these are conspiracy theories and so you know the the, the way to address them in, in my opinion and I think what we've seen at least in this case in New York City is that ignoring the the key stakeholders who in this case you know are the the population um, really, um, you know, risks the con further uh, amplification of these ideas, and the way the way to deal with them is by communication and partnership and listening and you know really incorporating you know small the, the, the beginning of trust you know leading to um, enhanced trust. It's about trust, and it's I wish it were about science because you know the science is quite well established but it's really not, it's about trust. Thank you, thank you, that was deep. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we are coming to a conclusion. I wanna just make uh, uh, one remark for everybody. Do you think as an outcome to this uh, symposium, there is a need to establish an international system to deal with vaccines at the time of uh, pandemics? one international system because i think the country here is going to launch this initiative you know i'll, I'll speak first because my mute my mute is off right now yes. <laughs> my mute is off yeah. you know i agree that that it's necessary i think it's difficult to achieve i think one one way of getting there um, is that a lot of these companies that we're talking about, the big vaccine makers are all, they are based in a particular country, but they're global, they're global companies. They have to be. So they need to consider the global situation. Thank you. Uh, David, what do you think? So I'm, I'm not sure regarding, there, is a lot of co there are a lot of companies that develop in vaccine. I'm sure that uh, the COVID-19 uh, will be with us uh, for many, many years. I'm not sure that it's COVID-19, maybe it will be COVID-2025. Uh, and uh, this is something uh, based on that what we know about the other vaccine, I think that the private uh, community is uh, doing well. However, I think that the big problem is uh, is the development of the vaccine. And as, as, as I uh, described, we started with the fundamental amount that we get from the Mr. Minister of Agriculture to develop vaccine for chicken. So before it came out, before the COVID-19 for human came out, so we have already the facility. And this is something that I need, I think that should be a lot of effort to put in the development, to, to develop the system can adapt, adapt itself very, very fast when new vaccine, we, a new virus will come and uh, we can develop vaccine very, very fast in safe mode. There is a lot of problem with, uh, uh, with all the diagnostic model, the, the, the the animal model for vac is not good enough for vaccine and uh, everyone knows because the animal, the mice is not infected by the viruses. So uh, I think there is a lot of, should be a lot of efforts to develop a model, a system uh, uh, for, the, you know, to, to check 
vaccine, uh, ex vivo, and not only in vivo, uh, in order to bring uh, as fast as possible safe vaccine to human. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the call was for international system for all vaccines, not only COVID-19. So uh, anyway, I agree with what you have said. Uh, what do you think, uh, Dr. Melita? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Of course, we are seeing shortages of various vaccines. Measles is one of the examples and we have basically um, almost a pandemic of measles that we hope uh, that we have uh, defeated. And the issue of the relationship between uh, governments, uh, private enterprises, developers, economy, is huge. Whether uh, this can be done under the WHO with new elements, and this is something that would be needed because nobody would accept a policing thing. But using the existing structures and feeding back to WHO what works, what does not work. We have the FENSA, the framework of engagement with non-state actors. It is binding our hands in discussions with the private sector but it is also needed. So it is really uh, bringing the initiative, I think, to the governing body, maybe having a whole set of discussions of why and what do we need and how do we see this global good available for everybody. We have moved a long time from Pasteur trying his first vaccine against rabies, from Sabin and his vaccines, from the state-owned companies, and I think that this is now a question of economic, political, social access and fairness uh, embedded in the SDGs. And maybe we need to bring also the Secretary General of the United Nations to that and other agencies to discuss it all together and finding the mechanisms how it can work. That is very encouraging because I think uh, the UAE is in, they, they, they are thinking to launch such initiative. Thank you so much. That was enlightening. Lastly, if in, in, in one minute, uh, Mr. Andrew, your input, please. Thank you. Oh, I I think I agree with all with with all the panelists. In, in I think the spirit of coordination is essential, but within that coordination, there should be some competition because competition spurs innovation. But I think too that the the way that um, the, the the international response coordination um, is handled may may have to depend uh, specifically on the disease itself because you do have geographic um, quirks so you know and and manufacturers and sponsors need need some incentives but they should also be a system where um, the incentive is sufficient to to make them want to work in a, in a particular area. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that was really very useful. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we come to our uh, to the end of our symposium. I, I hope that fair competition and honest competition will prevail over greed in regard to in regard to COVID nineteen. Thank you so much for everybody. That was a very useful uh, and uh, highly regarded uh, input and discussions. Hope to see you soon again. Salam alaikum. Peace be upon you. Uh, well, thank, salam, Dr. Uh, thank you, Salam, Dr. Thank you thank you everyone. Thank you a lot, everyone. Thank you for interesting presentation. Thank you, Dr. Ziad, for the moderate this uh, session. Thank you, Dr. David, Dr. Andrew, Dr. Milita, and Dr. Jail for your really interesting uh, presentation. We we'll, uh, we we'll learn actually a lot from your your side. We wish you. Uh, all uh, very successful efforts, and we hope to see you again in our next events. Thank you a lot, and good night. Thank you.